and unborn. Brothers and sisters, can all of you see here in the kitchen? Can you see her? Who are you for for president? We walked together down an important street. That street was Constitution Avenue. And only 27% of the 52% of the American people voted for our president. America has gone to sleep. Collective talents and abilities should be utilized by all of us in order to try and help make this world a better place in which to live. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the NBT at Home, Unbought and Unbossed, Reclaiming Our Vogue Conversation Series. This is the final part of our series, and I'm your moderator, Chelsea D. These conversations have been happening in tandem with the release of our Digital Commission Series, a series of public service announcements created by Black women artists, letting you know what's really real today okay, in conversation with history. Um, and the complete collection of commissions has been released. So check it out on our IG, our Facebook, our website, and bask in the glory, okay? Last week we released Go Tell It on the Mountain by Diane Smith. And this week we released About Her, Me by Hope Boykin. And we have the great privilege of three of our guests from the commission series being on the show tonight. So we will get to dive behind the magic, dive into the minds of those who brought us some really, really wonderful art. This series is in partnership with Michelle Obama's When We All Vote, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is on a mission to increase participation in every election and close the race and age voting gap. We're gonna talk a little bit later about what your voter to do today is, what we would like for you to be using the resources that we're gonna provide you with to get some action steps, some direct action steps around how we're approaching this election season because uh, it's, uh, it's right around the corner. Uh, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce, to welcome our guests for the evening through the magic of StreamYard, they are there. Hey! Hello. <laughs> Hi. Oh, it's, it's so good to see everybody's just beautiful, melanated, shining faces. <laughs> you all look wonderful. The lighting is spectacular. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you for having us. Yes, oh, great to see everyone. Yes. So um, let's let's just get a crack in with um with our check in. Um, maybe Diane, let's start with let's start with you. Let's start with you. Um, Diane, just tell us uh do tell us a little bit about yourself, your art form, what you do, um, and when did the political become personal for you? I am Diane Smith. Of course, you all know that. I um, my art, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, so which basically means that um, I figure out what I want to say and find the best medium to say it in, and okay. that doesn't always mean that I'm versed on that me in that medium. It's just what I need to use to articulate my voice at that point in time. Okay. Um, the political became personal for me the first time I was able to vote. Um, being a child of two immigrant parents who had tons of immigration issues. And quite frankly, if we were in these times, like this type of stuff was going on, then my parents would have been caught up in this whole immigration um, fiasco right now. So um, it became really, really important to me to have a voice in terms of voting because I understood they couldn't. And when my mother finally became a citizen, voting for her was one of the most important things 
on her to-do list as an American citizen. So yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for thank you for starting us off. Um Lady Dane, Lady Dane. <laughs> Hey, so listen, everybody. Um, <laughs> my internet is is acting up. It is acting up, honey, and it is turning it. And so uh, <laughs> we've been having we've been having like rain and storms all day here. Um, I am down in you know what we call DC, but we understand it's the land of the Piscataway peoples. So yes, um, yeah, we've you. been having rain like all day. And so my internet, it might cut me off and I'm gonna try to hop back in y'all. It's like hot scotch, right? Um, no, double dutch, <laughs> double dutch. Uh, <laughs> so, hey everybody, Lady Dave Figueroa, Didi, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, can you repeat the question, Chelsea? Stay yes. <laughs> no, wor no worries. No worries. Okay. That's what we're here for. That's what I'm here for. Uh, so tell us a little about, about your art form. What do you do? What's your, what's your, you know, what, what brought you here? Yeah. So I, you know, as, as far as like the art forms that I utilize, um, to, uh, I remember back in the day, a friend of mine said, you're a healer and you use art to heal. Right. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, so the art forms that I use are, you know, song, dance, uh, spoken word, uh, you know, writing, uh, movement, all of those types of things. Um, understanding that uh, that my existence is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be able to actually experience, experience um, my body in space is revolution is a revolutionary act, um, and so I, I a lot of my art combines you know song, dance, uh, spoken word, uh, literary word, um, and the you know the personal. I understood the personal was political at a very young age. I grew up in Baltimore. That's where I'm from originally. Um, and my aunt Liz, who I talk about a lot, my aunt Liz Figaro, she uh, was one of the first curators of the Great Blacks and Wax Museum um, in Baltimore. So I was a child uh, growing up in this museum. Um, and my, you know, my auntie, she was, she was an academic, she was a jazz singer, so she was an artist, and she also was an, an advocate and an activist. So she taught me um, that the education that I would need um, would not be given to me from an oppressive education system. So I had to be invested um, in, 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 in an expansive education that went beyond um, trying to seek it within institutions of, that were already designed and built on oppression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. There it is. Ooh, there it is. Thank you. Um, Hope. Hope Boykin. Uh, talk to us. Tell us about your art form and when did the political become personal for you? Well, uh, thank you and hello everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm I, someone asked me, they gave me a task to uh, put my mission statement into four words. So I've started to say, my name is Hope Boykin and I'm an educator, creator, mover and motivator. Uh -huh. It kind of rubs people the wrong way a little bit because I'm newly retired from um, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. So 20 years with this one company, people expect me to say that I'm a dancer, but I am all those other things as well. Mm. So as a choreographer, as a creator, which really encompasses everything, I uh, tend to try to speak. I, I, I say that I'm sharing my movement language and I've included um, a great deal in the last five or six years. My text, uh, I've was never I did, just newly getting courage to call it spoken word or poetry. I actually just joined a memoir writing class. So it's, it's, it's all of these things are a part of the creative person that I am. And the political became personal for me, I think rather late in life. My, my family, my mother was the first person in our family to go to college. 
She graduated from high school when she was 15, from college when she was 18, and she was an educator. And what she didn't want me to do was struggle. And so I had different advantages than she had, which is what every parent I think wants for their child is to remove <coughs> the riches and, and the potholes so they don't have to step in them. But I found that I floated on that a lot. Um, I knew that I that I, I always knew my life mattered and I always knew that I was a dark skinned black woman, but I was surrounded by people who just saw me as black. Um, it didn't matter what my color was because that's what most of the time I was surrounded uh, by a full room of white students, white people. I always went to, um, I went to private school from third grade until I graduated high school. And I said, I want to go to Howard University because I want to be surrounded by people that look like me. And so at 18, it was kind of cool. I was just thrilled to see so many people, but then it turned into something when I started to realize that it was my people who were di differentiating me against everyone else. And I say against because we often do that. We pit ourselves or pit others against one another. And I feel like our learning in this time has to really start with us when we want to make a larger change. And so now my my goals are to encourage and to grow. There, I definitely have experienced, I can go back and, and recall all the aggressions and micro and, and macro things that happened to me, but I started to feel the punctures coming from my people. Mm -hmm. And so I, we have to fix that as well as fixing all of the other things that are on the long list to continue to be better people. Um, yeah, that was long, but that's no, true. But, but right, <laughs> but, all of, but, but right, and planting all the seeds that, you know, I, I really do, I really would love to circle back and talk about this like within the community, right? The violence, what is happening? How are we able to heal within, within us? So that we can offer greater healing to the larger whole, you know, like we got to talk about that, name that stuff. Uh, so you know, let's let's get into being unbought and unbossed. Okay, MBT reached out to y'all and was like, you know, here, here's here's we would we want you to create a micro commission about around Shirley Chisholm's run bid for the for bid for the presidency. And also the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Like, how, what does it mean to be women of color, black women who have been heading a lot of these movements and, and, and social changes and yet not necessarily the beneficiaries of all the things that we have spearheaded the society to learn about. So tell me, tell me, what was the inspiration behind your commission, the commission that you did? If you could tell us the title of your commission, um, and then a little bit about the inspiration, whether it was a, a historical figure or a movement, you know, I would love to know what, what inspired these pieces and whoever, whoever would like to start us off, jump on in. All right, Diane. Um, <laughs> I, first of all, I was really excited when I got the commission and I didn't know what I was gonna do, but just thinking about Shirley Chisholm, I started thinking about the women who came before her. And one night Fannie Lou oh. Hamer popped in my head. And I thought, besides I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, what do we really know about Fannie Lou Hamer? How much do we really know? And that included me and I, did a quick search and then that evening I, I became obsessed. So much so that my friends know it and my friend Bo McCall made me the shirt. I was just <laughs> the shirt. Like, is that Miss Fannie Lou? It is, it's a triple T with Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. So I became obsessed with <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, you know, like stalker like oh. obsessed, right? Like if she was here right now, they'd be like, Miss Hamer, there's a lady in front of your building. <laughs> and reason why, um, just thinking about the start of her life, mm -hmm. you know, from the time she was six years old, she was working on a plantation. Mm -hmm. She quit school at 12 years old. She spent most of her adult life on the plantation until her and a small group of African-Americans decided they were gonna go register to vote. And the more things that happened to her, the more determined she was. 
So when I hear people today, particularly women and those who look like us say they're not voting, what does it matter? I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you really, you know, yeah, I just can't, I can't imagine um, squandering that, right? Because there's a certain amount of privilege for anyone that looks like us right now to say they're not going to vote because Fannie Lou Hamer didn't have a choice. She didn't have a choice, nor the people around her at that particular time. What they went through, all of the obstacles that got, and the fact that she made it as far as she did from her food, um, what she did for those who were food insecure, creating farms. I mean, this woman was freaking amazing with little or no education, but her intelligence far surpassed anyone that I've read about in a mm. long time. Mm. Mm. So your piece was in dedication to her, like... It was in dedication. Roots. It was in dedication to her life, her roots, mm. but it was a testament to Black women in general. Mm. And... Um, all of the ways in which we are out here, even today, you know, for me, it was sort of a contemporary statement too, in terms of how all of us are collectively making change and working in the in the background. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there are those in the foreground that are that are just like taking all of that and you know making it their own. Like Fannie Lou Hamer is virtually unsung in the civil rights conversation in terms of curriculum, in terms mm -hmm. of celebration, in terms of like just talking about her. Again, what we I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. That is the thing that we the single most thing that we know about her. But the fact that we are sitting here today in this quad having this conversation is in part due to the work that she done. She did her work in the Delta, but that still it still trickled to impact us all. Shirley Chisholm would not have been Shirley Chisholm if they weren't if there wasn't um, a Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm, 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 mm. So Fannie Lou Hamer to you is like the epitome of being unbought and unbossed. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> This, I mean, from the fact that she went in to have a particular surgery, you know, female, mm -hmm. and they gave her a hysterectomy. Like, yep. it's still happening. That's still happening. And it's still happening. But mm -hmm. that happened to her and it did not stop. You know, she mm -hmm. kept going. Mm -hmm. um, when she was arrested, it was in 1963 and taken to the jail and the way she was beaten. Mm -hmm. And she was like, that made her even more determined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was just free, free from fear in a way that was like remarkable to be under that level of oppression. Because it, it was the beatings and the description of the beatings that really stuck with me about Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, right. tenacity. And I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? Like, what does it take? What 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 are you what are you calling upon? What are you calling so, so that to that point on Sunday, I went to vote and I'm standing on the line, right? And uh -huh. I'm cold because I didn't dress well. Wow. And I'm out there shivering and I'm like, the ancestors <laughs> and right here. I'm like, the ancestors, my little fingers are shriveling. I was like, this is a small price to pay. I'm going to stand right here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not even complain. I'm going to be, this is, this cold is temporary. No one is beating my ass physically. <laughs> I'm a little chilly. I'm yeah. going to stand here. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for starting us off. That was <laughs> yes. The, just the oh, actually, um, Dane, can we talk about your piece next? Can we talk about um, your commission? Because I just I, I feel like it it so encapsulated my anxieties around voting and what it means to be a participant in, in a society that also, like we see with Fannie Lou Hamer, will brutally and savagely attack you for asserting your citizenship. You know what I mean? And so what the legacy of that, the the trauma, the, the need for release from that trauma, you know, all of, I really was picking a lot of that up from your piece. So can you just talk to us a bit about your inspiration? Yeah, so it's, you know, I'm someone, right, who is was told at a very young age, you better vote, right, because ancestors died for you to be able to vote. And so, 
I yeah. literally, can y'all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Because my, my screen is a little bit delayed. Um, but, you know, my ancestors were like, you know, uh, my, my elders were like, your ancestors die for you to vote for gone and vote and all these things, along with also telling me the history, right, of the fact mm -hmm. that the idea of democracy did not start with white men. The mm -hmm. idea of democracy, um, the, the truth of democracy, the reality of democracy, right, um, actually originated with indigenous peoples um, and that white men stole those ideas from indigenous peoples. Um, and so that's number two. Uh, <laughs> number three, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I live where I live, right? Which means that during the Obama administration, um, I had... Uh, the ability and and I, uh, uh, and I was uh, often at the Obama White House for specific events. Um, and I watched the ways in which the nation, because we had a black president, um, sort of, and, I, and not everyone, right? But a lot of people um, became lulled away from, mm -hmm. Um, our commitment to dismantling white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that really, really um, pissed me off. So, <laughs> okay. so and okay. like, you know, I remember, right? I remember black and brown and indigenous trans women being at the White House, being at some of these, these state buildings saying, it, white supremacy is the thing that is trying to kill us all. Mm -hmm. And oh. us being told, shush, give credit where credit is due. Why y'all always angry? Why you always got to make a fuss about something? Can't you just understand that everybody's doing the best that they can? Go slow. Remember Nina Simone talked about that? <laughs> Keep on saying go slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, meanwhile, literally, we were witnessing people dying yeah. because of a system that was born in white supremacy, genocide, and cattle slavery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, um, and then 2016 happened. And that was a rude awakening for some folks. Um, and so my piece was really about the fact of saying, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a vote, right? Like vote, vote. Yes, yes, yes. We got to vote. But what's the work that needs to happen? Because there are a lot of people, perhaps some people watching on this, on this call tonight, who thinks that voting is it. And it is not, baby. It is not. Voting is, is really the beginning. Because the work of dismantling white supremacy internalized and mm -hmm. systematic is something that we must be committed to and we must be vigilant about. Mm -hmm. And no amount of, um, and, and you kind of brought this up earlier, Chelsea, as we were talking, because I said it before, right? Our salvation does not rest in the system. Our salvation, we yeah. are our salvation. Yeah. Build community, care about community. Mm -hmm. It is it, like, literally, I just heard today about another black trans woman who was killed. <sighs> I heard on Monday about another black man um, who was killed by the police. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. So yeah. yes, you know what? I want a Biden Harris in the White House, yes, 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 let's do that. Because I, I can tell you this, four more years of this other man, oh no, oh no. The, the, the United States has always, has always been um, plagued by fascism. Fascism is white supremacy by another name. Okay. And while there are some folks right now who are talking about authoritarianism and fascism, when I think about people, like Fanny Lou, when I think about people like Frances Tom Thomas uh, Th Thompson, who was a black trans woman in the 1800s, who was an abolitionist, yes. and was fighting, right? Mm -hmm. She was fighting um, for black women. Yes. Um, when I think about us, I think about the fact that there are some of us who have never enjoyed liberty in this country have never enjoyed freedom from oppression. And so what else gonna do on the 4th of November? 
what that's going to do on the 5th of November. Because no matter who wins, white supremacy still got its hands around America's neck. And we must dismantle it and destroy it completely. So that's really what my piece was about. My piece was about the fact that I was, I was like, how do I, as a person who believes in abolition and a person who uh -huh. believes in creating a system where really, <laughs> you know, I asked the question, does the United States deserve to survive this? If it won't change, if it won't These change. These are the questions. These are the questions. So as a person who is like wrestling with these questions, but also understanding that four more years of who's in the White House right now could mean death, death for so many more people. Mm -hmm. but, but, but wanting to also speak to us about us really being committed to dismantling white supremacy internally and systematically, but also going to vote. Yep. That's where that piece was born from. From all of those, all, <laughs> all those feelings, child. Yes. And honoring, Ooh. right? Like honoring yes. Absolutely. black Absolutely. and indigenous women. Contribution. Who, ha and who have already been doing the work yeah. that white women just got hip to. That's that. Okay, did y'all come for unbought and unbossed or not? Nah? Okay, because that's what we really on tonight. Hope, <laughs> talk to us, talk to us <laughs> about the inspiration behind your piece. <laughs> well, it's it's so interesting because I really was trying to wrap my head around the women uh, in my immediate life or those women that I'd seen work and strive to make the thing that I love so much happen. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, growing up, um, in, in Durham, North Carolina, my mother let me, and I love my mom. Uh, sometimes I, I get frustrated with, uh, Oh, someone, someone brought this up to me. I'm just going to go back. They said that our, our family, their, my mother's parents fought for a certain amount of freedom and then didn't necessarily understand the freedom that they had or that they used. And then my mother fought for, and her generation fought for another type of freedom, the freedom um, in, during the civil rights uh, movement and, and all the things that are happening. And she doesn't really quite understand the freedom that I have now, or maybe it's too far, or maybe I'm not saying all the things that I could say in the right way with subject verb, with subject verb agreement. And then now young people have a different type of freedom. They post all the time freedom. The mm -hmm. let me say whatever it is, I think freedom. That is a little bit uh, frightening to me, but it, that is what I've been working for. And so I wanted to think about the women in the dance world in particular, who I watched create businesses and struggle and fight and and build up the the black dance community and it took me right back to uh joan myers brown of philodenko geraldine blunden of dayton contemporary dance theater lula washington of lula washington dance ensemble cleo oh. parker robinson it's in denver and oh. then um and then Ann Williams, who founded the Dallas Black Dance Theater. And Joe Myers Brown and Cleo Parker Robinson and Lula Washington are still living mm. founders and working mm. founders. And then I was hired at Alvin Ailey by this woman, Judith Jamson. And if anyone has ever even laid eyes on her, she looks unbought and unbossed. <laughs> just, just, she just walks in and you're like, and unbothered. Um, <laughs> and, and all of those things are muscles that I feel like we have to learn to grow. And it's not something that ne necessarily came naturally to me. So in my work, I was thinking, well, here are all the things that I wanted to say, but I needed to curb my words. I needed to make sure that I wasn't too loud or too demonstrative or don't be boisterous. Once I believe someone gave me that as a nickname, one of the teachers growing up, Boisterous Boykin. Well, maybe I just had things to say, but even though but boisterous is looked at as a negative. So why is it that I'm curbed by that? What is it about me that, that imposes some type of threat on you? 
And so why can't I do all of the things that I want to do? Why can't I say that I want to do all of these things, especially when I'm watching and I can look at uh, women who are pioneers in the dance world who have created um, and founded the International Association for Blacks in Dance. Why can't I look at them and say, well, I can be that unbossed and that unbought and learn to grow the muscle to be unbothered by the things that I need to say, the way that I choose to vote, how I look at you. Well, I don't believe in that because the work that we do, the work that we all do, we get punished for little things and then we do the work anyway. Someone says, oh, it would have been better if you had been that. And then we continue to do the work anyway. Hope you could be a little bit more of this, a little bit less of this and you say, okay, and you do the work anyway. So how is it that we are not, you know, hugely powerful with the muscles in our arms mm -hmm. and in our hearts because we would do the work anyway. And like you said, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, was beaten and bruised and did the work anyway. She was told she was knocked down and over and over and did the work anyway. And so without that, without that future, and I, like I said, I was thinking about the people as an inspiration who were in the field that I love so much, how they did it. I really don't know. I mean, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's shocking to me. How, how do you have these buildings? How, how were you, you know, um, creating these companies that are 50, 60 years old when, like, how were these women doing it? And so if they've done it, then they've opened up a path. They've taken that. I don't know what that um, that tool is, but they take that tool and they, they've, they've chopped, they've moved a path for me. And now I can take this and shift out and create more room and more space for more young people. And it's my duty to do it. And, and that is part of my work. And if I stop working, then I stop giving people encouragement. And I'm supposed to do that. So and that is just a beautiful actually segue into my next question, which is about sustaining ourselves in the work and sustaining ourselves um, in the resistance. Because if we're talking about dismantling white supremacy beyond just election day voting, if we're talking about uprooting in a radical way the roots of colonialism, which is what we're dealing with, you know, globally, you know, if we're really talking about doing that, that's a long, long haul, long haul game. And how do we preserve ourselves in the midst of this? So something I, I talked about um, in, in the previous MBT at Home series and had the great pleasure of meeting Adrian Marie Brown to talk more about this concept of pleasure activism, you know, of letting the information that you learn from pleasure and joy and the erotic and what feels good to you, using that information to root yourself in not taking anything less than pure joy, pure relaxation, being able to rest and be and, and thrive and, and be full. So in the vein of pleasure activism, what's making you bloom right now? You know, what, 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 what's, what's bringing you pleasure? And it can be small. It can be, you know, the, the, the marigolds in my neighborhood, or it could be huge. Like I can feel a change of coming, like whatever that, whatever that is for you. <laughs> Who like to start us off? Diane? <laughs> I ask and then I just. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, <laughs> um, what's making me bloom is the ability to create and share. Um, I think that as a, as a creator, I have an unbelievable gift. And, um, and not only a gift for the world, but a gift for myself, that I have a space to articulate um, the things that are most worrisome for me, the things that rest way down inside that I don't always have the words for, but I can transform that into something and, and, and then be able to articulate, this is why I've transformed that into. And what gives me joy is the fact that I can do that, whether it's photography, whether it's film, whether it's painting, whether it's sculpture, large scale installation, I have multiple modalities to bring my voice forward, unapologetically so. Um, what brings me joy is my love for black people. I love black people in all form, shape, Everything about us, I love us, I'm ride or die. I love black women. Um, it brings me joy looking at all your beautiful faces. Um, these are the spaces that I find with everything that's going on in the world, 
um, this makes me feel like I'm home. I feel like I'm home. When I can talk to even my girlfriends on the phone, that brings me joy. The people in my life brings me joy. There's so much that we have to contend with out in the world. So I find joy in all the things that are in my lived experience, in my day to day, all of it makes me happy. The people that I am fortunate to spend my time with brings me joy. And um, no orange man in the White House is going to take that from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and white supremacy is not going to take that from me. And what I say about that is, in spite of that, all of this beauty exists. In spite of um, the ways in which we have been knocked down in a t um, uh, communities bulldozed, men and women beaten and hung, and we are still freaking here. We are here and we're, I mean, look at us. And to be able to, 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 to recognize that and embrace that, that's a space of joy for me. Ooh. And, and that, I mean, and that is with the backdrop of all the things that are happening, you know, from the police brutality and all of the ills in our communities and our societies, which even, even like Hope talked about in the ways in which um, we pit each other against one another with all of that. The counter for that is the ways in which I move through my life with all of the things that are around me that I've been able to, to hold on to. It, it, you know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for starting us off, Diana. It's just so beautiful. I mean, you're getting so much action in the comments here about people are really appreciating what, what you're saying. And, 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 and can and, I just say one more yeah. thing? I'm so sorry. And I have to tell you, being a part of this um, this group of commissions, I mean, that has been, you know, I do a lot of work and put up a lot of things. And this particular during this particular time, I've been really, really fortunate to be able to make work and make a lot of work. And I would say this particular commission amongst this group of women has been something that has been so profound and profoundly impactful for me. And it has, yeah, it, it just makes me feel good looking at all of that work. Like I sit and like I, I was waiting every Wednesday for, <laughs> for the release. I mean, it's <laughs> special and I, I'm, I'm really honored to have, you know, been on, on this stage with you and on the bill with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Diane. And if, fam, if you please put in the comments, what is making you bloom right now? Let I want. We're collecting. We're we're, we're creating our toolkit of of what's going to keep us sustained and thriving in the midst of this. And so, please let's collect. Let's 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 gather uh, comments from the, from the fam who are watching. Uh, hope. <laughs> I tell you, the 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 blooming. <laughs> some days I feel like I need to like reread all of the things I said mm -hmm. I wanted, and um, look at the list of things that are just happening. Like Diane said, she uh, is fortunate enough to have work now. The work was coming so much that I didn't mm -hmm. want to even tell anyone because I didn't feel like I was. Like it was right to be happy that I was able to work, you know, like especially with COVID and then then the the other our other huge crisis is racial racial crisis that's ongoing. But the one that everyone saw, I said, you know, I, I was I would say often that George Floyd wasn't the first black man that was killed, you know, unnecessarily by the police, but he's the one that the entire world saw, um, and so that's why so much. Uh, so much happened across, I mean, my, my friends from all over the world were reaching out, but what I feel like I didn't, um, was hard to put into words was the ability to reach so many people. Um, I would hear people, I've heard people who've just joined Zoom for the first time. I'm like, you're kidding me. This has been a lifeline to me, uh, having 
cameras. I would even see Diane walking down the street with her camera on her, you know, uh, on her on her shoulder, having cameras, having lights, being having a monitor, being able to do this work because I was gearing towards something else, and then it opened up into the life that I could use. So this morning I taught um, choreographing for a university in Virginia. And then an hour after that, I was with a dancer in London. And then right before this, I was in LA. Yeah. There's no way I would have been able you to would, do that. You would not. Um, and so <laughs> as tired as it makes me and as frustrated as I sometimes get from, and I need to get a real chair and not this stool, that's why I keep shifting. <laughs> I mean, literally I had a knee surgery in August the middle of August. And I was like, well, I don't know how I'm going to work. I have an assistant who logs on, demonstrates them. I mean, how much better could it get mm -hmm. when I didn't know what was going to happen after my retirement? And now it just doesn't stop happening. So that's the blooming. Um, and the thing that's giving me joy are those young people. They are winning. They are logging on. They don't have teachers. And if they are in person, they're dancing in boxes with masks on. I can't recognize them. You know, like they literally have these uh, rectangles on the floor. They have on masks. Only one student wears the same shirt every day, every week <laughs> that I see her. So I know her name, but I've got to go through the list and say, who is that? You know, but watching them, knowing that they are going to change um, they've taken things so seriously. They know that they can't be frivolous with their lives and that COVID is real and they're making these sacrifices to do this work. I tell them all the time that, that, that they are winning. And that is what's really, really giving me pleasure. If they can show up, then I can show up. And I'm just so blessed to be able to, to reach young people in this way right now. Oh, wonderful. This is, I, I like this question. I'm going to keep asking. <laughs> Lady Day, talk to us. Okay. Um, I was like, okay, did I press it? I did it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, everything, everything that Diane and, and Hope said is um, very affirming, right? And, and absolutely beautiful. Um, and I, and I agree. I agree. It, being a part of, I remember our first meeting, right, where it was us and we were talking about the piece and we kind of talked a little bit about what we were going to do um, and the ways in which uh, love, uh, love was in that room. Um, and not just, uh, not just like, oh, we're artists and we have that kinship, but a love that goes, that, that has its roots deep, 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 deep to the beginnings of time. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I think about, you know, the things that, you know, that are, are that are assisting me and blooming, um, I, it's, it's like, I think the things that are assisting me and blooming are also the things that are bringing me joy, um, which is ancestors, right? My, I, I often say that, you know, I'm here because my ancestors imagined me into being and then put into my DNA the, the, the gift of imagining so that therefore I could imagine myself into being. Um, I think community, right? The ways in which community continues to pour wisdom back and forth into one another. Um, art. Uh, something that really resonated with me that, that you know, saying I was talking about was like, and hope as well, right? Like this, this um, time where um, I am, I am not only making art, right? But that there are um, many, many, many of us who are artists, despite what's happening in the world that that, that it feels like there is a um, disconnect because we can't physically touch one another, but that we are still connecting, um, and we are still uh, we are still giving birth to art, um, and that in this moment, what is being recognized by the world, if not always honored by the world, <laughs> is the deep, deep, deep necessity and essentiality of art and the artist. Um, and so, yeah, that's my, that's my yeah. short of my long. 
<laughs> oh, goodness. I just feel like the, the, answering this question is a piece of art in and of itself. It's, it, it is, it's the next commission. You didn't know that, but it's the beginnings of the next commission. Uh, so, um, Dane, actually, you brought up a really great segue talking about ancestry. So let's dig into Fannie Lou Hamer. Let's dig into what she did in the, dy the dynamics of this woman. The dynamics of this woman, Diane, you gave a really great, um, you know, setup of the of the biographical, um, like really, uh, that was really actually really great. And so you've you've done some heavy heavy lifting for me. Um, <laughs> and I actually just want to zoom in on her activism to battle food insecurity in the in the Delta and like her creating. Oh, let me actually pull up exactly what it's called. Um, she was a co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus, and then her food sovereignty activism started the Freedom Farm Cooperative. And this was a farming collective to feed the community and battle food insecurity. And they had, I, I just wanna talk about the, a specific program they had called the Pig Project, where they would raise pigs and then give a family a pig. And the only thing that they needed was for them to give them a piglet back when that pig had a baby so that they could keep this kind of um, system going, they're able to give communities protein and feed people. And so I have two quotes from Fannie Lou Hamer that I would love to share and then we'll dig into it. But one thing she said was, when you've got 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to say or do. The next thing she said is, if you give a hungry man food, he will eat it. But if you give him food, but if you give him land, he will grow his own food. So just to start us off, you know, going with this metaphor of land and having land and, and creating systems that sustain the community from a from from a, a local place. You know, you're not you're not trying to like get the global perspective going, you're trying to help the person who lives next door to you. You're trying to make sure that that family has a pig and then we get their pig and we get that pig to them. And you know what I mean? So how are we, how are we building this? So the first question I have for y'all is, you've got some land, okay? You've got some land, what do you wanna grow? <laughs> and this can be literal, this can be <laughs> whatever, but what do you wanna grow on this land? Whoever wants to start us off. Oh, take it away. <laughs> I love this question um, because I I often share and and teach about the the mm. list of awesome and not going not always pointing out all of the things you'd like to fix but let's add to what you already have and so with the land the more you do the more work you do on the land the more you uh, am I saying the right term you you till the ground soil. you are yeah. till yeah. the soil yes. I'm not a farmer but um but I do believe that the more you add the more you can share uh -huh. and so it, it's funny because people would often say hope you're really generous and I would say oh I like for you to have your own not necessarily mm. some of mine and mm. that is that is uh, twofold, not because I'm being selfish, but let me give you your item. And so if there's something that I, I would build, it would be it would be a place. I would probably build a, a, a colony or community so that Ooh. artists could continue to create. Um, uh, Diane McIntyre, Jawale Willajo Zolar were on a panel once and they were talking about some place in Harlem, and I'm sorry, I don't know this history, they were talking about how dancers would just come and perform and rehearse or sit around. And I'm thinking, where is that place? Where is the location where we can have an artist community? We can have a house, um, a Harlem house or something, you know, where you can just, oh, I need a studio or I need a place to come and paint. Or I want to have an interview with Lady Dana. Lady Dana, I'd like to talk about that. Or Diane, could you help do something for me? Um, could you mentor me? 
if there's a place for that, then people will continue to grow. And I just, I just feel like the arts are the, the, the art, art itself is something that is, um, that breaks barriers and has no language barrier. I've been in museums around the world. I've met people and not known a lick of English and been able to communicate with sound and music. And if we can continue to do that, then we will continue to build. Mm. And that housing piece, that housing piece. Is- Harlem House. Let's do it. Let's, let's Harlem House. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just how many generations of stability are created by having a place to live, you know, and not having to worry about where you, if you're going to wind up on the streets, you know what I mean? How much stress does that take off of you? I just want to give big ups to um, Sis Mariah Moore in Louisiana, who's working with trans communities to provide housing and bought land and is building homes um, for trans folks. And this is huge because this is housing is the, the, it's like if you don't have housing, this is the opening the door to all kinds of vulnerabilities and and casualties. And, and, I, and I think that being able to provide housing for folks is yeah. setting up generations. You know, it's giving generations a chance to actually thrive and go and be because I don't have to worry about where I'm going to sleep tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm with you on the housing. I would want to grow sunflowers. Sunflowers detoxify the soil and they just make people happy. So <laughs> I want to throw that out there. <laughs> Who else? What are you growing on your land? You just got some acres. What's up? For someone that's not having a <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> two things come to mind for me, um, metaphorically. Of uh-huh. The idea of the mustard seed and lemons. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Those two things. Lemon trees. Um, you know, just metaphorically having, you know, what you can turn, turn the lemons into lemonade kind of metaphor. <sighs> You know, um, what can you do, right, with a little? You take a little and you make it into a lot. Our ancestors had had so much faith in um, in in just doing that. You know, um, that unbe- unbelievable to me that that was a hard question for me because there were so many things going through my mind in terms of sowing something to make it grow. And there's so many things that could be sowed to make it grow that I couldn't really focus on on one thing. And so the mustard seed and the, the lemon that came to mind only because those were things I heard throughout my childhood, you know, like mm-hmm. you can turn lemons into lemonade. Like she was not that, per- she was that person that um, if you told Granny something was wrong, she'd be like, you better go figure that out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 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 <laughs> I ain't got time for you sitting around here, belly aching. Go figure it out. You know? We are our <laughs> own salvation. There it is. Right. You know. <laughs> so yeah, there was just so many things that were running through my mind um, in terms of um, need and want. And you talk about mm. when I think of water and the 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 lack of water globally particularly uh-huh. you know there were just so many things you know and and to so you need water and people are struggling from flint michigan on like it was just so much and i know you said to think about the immediate but my brain just doesn't work like that mm-hmm. you know i tend to think about the diaspora <laughs> mm-hmm. and the connectivity of it all because it's all you know it's all connected yeah you can't isolate one slice of it Okay, so you're just like, let me start with the symbolic crops, and then <laughs> we'll you move know, expand. You know, and then of course I went through that whole thing in that short time of like thinking about what land ownership meant to mm. black and brown people in black people in this country, um, the enslaved Africans. You know what what land meant. You know, and. Yeah, and the idea of owning land, like, is isn't that an invention of colonialism? You right. know what I mean? The idea you really of own land. land? Is it private property? Is that really a thing? You know, <laughs> and thinking about the ways in which, you know, I mean, land is such a, I mean, such a bedrock of, um, so, you know, systemic racism and white supremacy, you know, it, when you, land makes you think of from redlining, all of the ways in yeah. which land has been 
this thing that we as black people were told to own, but it, it was always a barrier in terms of our ownership of, of land and property, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a, there's lots of layers to untangle within that. Um, Lady Dan, what do you want to grow? So I keep going for my um for the mouse, right? To, to unmute myself. And I'm like, wait, you on your phone, girl. Uh, <laughs> um land. Oh, this is such a, you know, it's right because it's like, do does anyone actually own land, right? Um, or, or is it or is the or is the question for me, right? As I think about, as I think about the question, is the question for me is. Um, what would happen if there was a piece of land that I was able um, to create a personal relationship with? Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, mm -hmm. That like that was not that was not interfered with by white supremacy. Um, mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. I think about that, I think about um, food, right? I think about what are the things that we actually need to sustain our bodies. Um, our hearts and our mind, um, herbs, right? Herbs, mm -hmm. you can make medicines from herbs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think about, I also think about, you know, what is this uh, building homes, right? So that like folks don't gotta worry about do they have a roof over their head or not, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then I also, you know, I also, because we have the, we have the gift of imagining, right? Uh, a place in which we, um, can sow love into the land and that, and that that love actually grows and spreads out. Um, a place where um, we can sing songs of freedom into the land um, and that the land actually cultivates things for us to be able to sustain our freedom. A place in which we are able to do ritual, ritual um, that perhaps is in some of our DNA. Um, and it was hidden there by our ancestors who had, it, had to hide it there because they were forced to worship a white God. Um, a place in which we can celebrate each other hold each other, heal with each other, heal ourselves um, without the sense of capitalistic urgency. A place that could feel perhaps like a heaven on earth. A place where we all free from oppression. Um, yeah. Be in a okay. good relationship with the land and good yeah. relationship with the land. That's what I think about. <laughs> yes. I mean, but I also do feel like, Dane, you just kind of laid down an incantation that was like going to bring this forth. OK, I don't know if y'all heard the, in, the intonation and the intentionality, but I heard it. I felt it. So I feel like it's coming to us now. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. Thank you for getting that started. <laughs> uh, so, going back to this idea of if we are our Diane, own Diane, you was on mute. I think oh, Diane, Diane what was saying something. You was on mute. Oh, Diane, <laughs> what you saying? Oh, oh Diane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Now I was going to say that there, I mean, I just read recently there, there a group of Black folks that did just that. They bought a a, a, a a lot of land to build their own. Have in you Georgia, guys heard of in Georgia, where this is happening? In Georgia, right? They bought a land to build their own town. Right. You know, and just Dane just made me, Lady Dane, you just made me think of mm -hmm. that just now. With what? So, I, you know, I was envisioning that that was their planning meeting. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> With Dane laying it down, like you, you were that was their planning meeting. And, and you were, I was like, that must have been their planning meeting. That's how they got there. <laughs> because that is the, and you know, but that brings up a good, um, that brings up that brings up something for me, Diane, in the sense of, I was reading about this town that they want to start in Georgia, 
as a safe space for black folk. And I mean, not exclusively black, but like as centering blackness and, 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 and being protective of it. But then I was a little concerned because I was like, but I know what state it's in and, and I know what they look like. And if I did some research, maybe I could find where this place is. And so then my mind starts going to safety, safety. Say, right. Then how do we make knows what comes up? Black Wall Street. You know, those things start to right, 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 right. Then we start to go. Oh goodness, to be to be to be isolated in one space is that? You know, how do that's we? That's a good. That I mean, they, it is. It, you need a fortress, right? You would think because I mean, we. Have, this is, I mean, talk about land. I mean, Central Park, right? Right. <laughs> Central Park was bulldozed. Seneca Village. Eminent domain to be, you know, to make mm. Central Park. So, mm. what did, yeah, what does it mean when we are on land? What does it mean when we are developing a relationship with the land? We are sowing love into it. And the, the legacy of that being interrupted or there being some type of um, violent disconnect with that. But at the same time, you know, I don't want to necessarily stop dreaming and stop sowing seeds and stop mm -hmm. uh, trying to fi find, cultivate and create space just because of the of the threat of violence. And yet it is ever present. Well, and I mean, so, we're under a threat of violence every day, right? Right. That is our, our daily life. Reality. Mm -hmm. That's our reality, you know, violence and trauma. And we are moving through it and in the midst of that. So, you know, my question, and this actually segues into my question, which is if we are our own salvation, what do we do to protect ourselves and community um, every day? And so that's the question I'm posing to y'all. And this could be as simple as, you know, I'm, you know, I'm making sure that I'm drinking enough water or, you know, I'm out, I'm, here's an organization you need to reach out to. I'm organizing and, and, and activating with them. Um, you know, what are, what, are, what are we doing to keep each other safe? I'm thinking about something, um, and Dane, since you're 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 where I'm at, you're you're in DC. Um, the 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 Karan Hilton um, incident that happened with MPD um, Monday, or it was very recently, um, and the the unrest that 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 popped off in response to that, and Black Lives Matter DC created this hashtag We Keep Us Safe, or they're using this hashtag We Keep Us Safe. And it made me think about this conversation of how are we keeping ourselves safe? And then I think about hope, which you were talking about earlier, being pitted against one another and the violence that comes with um, having to turn, you know, turning all of that anger or hatred or feeling of helplessness onto one another. Um, how are we how are we healing that? And I think, Dane, you mentioned the rates of murder of black trans women is unacceptable. It, and it is it is us within our community that is committing these murders. This is the most horrifying thing when I, you know, I can't watch I can't watch all of the videos. But when I when I can bring myself to the the, the, the familiarity the familiar familiarity of these women, the familiarity of these community members who are attacking these women. I mean, this is we have got to name that. You know, we've got to name that, and we've got to we've got to we've got to deal with that. Because how are we keeping us safe? How are we our, our own salvation when this violence is what is, you know, cycling through uh, cycling through the community? So, um, what was the question? Let me actually go. go, go. The question was, uh, <laughs> oh, Lordy, Lord, where's my soapbox? Let me get off of it. Um, uh, <laughs> but what are you doing? What are you doing to 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 make yourself feel safe? What are you doing to? Um, you know, build a sense of safety and security for, for yourself, for your family, for your community? What, what What's that look like? What's safety look like for you today? I think it's basically what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to I wanna say something though, right? Okay. Because I, I want to say something. I recognize, right, that, that transphobia as we experience it today, right, is that its roots um, and homophobia and classism and anti-blackness and <laughs> and biphobia and ableism um, that, that you know that all of patriarchy uh, massage noir as we say right mm -hmm. that all of these things find their root within colonization and imperialism yeah. and so 
that I often tell folks, I say, well, listen, if you are a black person and you are transphobic, you are actually doing the work of your oppressor. You are actually perpetuating a white supremacist system. And I need for you to heal whatever trauma you need to heal so that you can operate within clarity. True um, liberation. So, so I'm, <laughs> true so liberation. I want to I, mm-hmm. I, I address. I want to address that too, right? Because I think that, um, and that's why I talk about right. It's not just about we must we must go and we must address systematic white supremacy. We must also address when we internalize it, yes. right? We must also dismantle the internalized white supremacy. Yes. And so, um, my work, um, it. it is about uh, when I think about like what keeps me safe, right? What keeps me safe? Um, I build community with people who are invested in not just my survival, but my thriving. Um, Because I am not invested in um, giving time, energy, or priority to folks who are not. Mm-hmm. And I think that as I think that when I was young, right, like I was told I, I was uh, I was given an idea of love that was really abuser dynamics. Mm-hmm. And so, he, you know, the healing work that I do for myself and recognizing that I have the right to dictate to other folks how you how you are in community with me. Yeah. So one th- mm-hmm. one way that I keep myself safe is that I prioritize my right to say, if you are going to be in community with me, you must be committed to dismantling white supremacy and all of its ills, period. No matter what color you is. Um, I, um, I think for some other folks, right? I think that I tell other folks who are more willing um, to arm themselves in different in other ways that they mm-hmm. have the right to do that. Um, I tell black women, I- I- indigenous women in my life that you have the right to your rage mm. and you have the right to defend yourself against harm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, I keep myself safe by Um, Making sure that I'm also, when I'm in conversation with other women, um, that I am centering and celebrating our right to be safe. Mm -hmm. And saying, you know, you don't got to, you don't got to let somebody in your life, baby, just because. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and just because they share blood with you. Just because y'all went to high school together, just because y'all took that class together, you have the right to dictate the terms of love. Mm. So that's, you know, Ooh, that's, that's how a I word. Keep myself say. <laughs> dictate the terms <laughs> of love. I'm going to need you to trademark that. Then I'm going to need you and to make the world, And also fighting for a world, right? And also fighting mm-hmm. for a world that actually. Um, where white supremacy does not exist because I understand that my black trans sisters are being murdered, not simply because of an individual, but because of a system that has, Mm -hmm. that has tried to exterminate us since before 1619. Mm -hmm. Since the minute that white men stepped their dirty feet (laughs) on mother Africa's soil and on this soil. So yeah, go off, okay. And this is and this is and I I cannot stress enough, Dane, what you are saying about the right to feel safe. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to drop it right now. The voter to do is make an election day plan, right? Make an election day plan. And I I want to talk about this at this particular moment moment because I do want to center safety. What makes you feel the safest? Do you need to go with others? How can you do that in a COVID, uh, you know, a, a aware way? Are there? Do you know what to do if you face discrimination at the at the from a poll worker? You know what I mean? Do you do you do you know the numbers to call? Should that happen? So making an election day plan is 
you know, yes, making sure you have something to sit on. Say, for instance, if you're planning on standing in line for a long time or a lot of those types of comfort things, but also safety and that you have the right to feel safe and your safety should be centered in, in, in everything that you're doing. I can't I can't support that more. I can't support it more. Um, all right. Who, who's got next? Who's got next? We're thinking about safety. What are you doing to make yourself feel safe? What's that look like for you? Diane, Hope. <laughs> uh, Hope, you want to take it next or you want me to? Whatever you like, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I will say that um, I don't always believe that I'm doing mm -hmm. enough for myself. Um, and I know that the only way to continue to uh, do those, I, I guess there's that there's that never feeling like you are enough. And what has been giving me a security is that I am a part of the, it's not really a steering committee, it's like a working group of um, the AGMA, which is the American Guild of Mu Musical Artists. We, they, we now have a black caucus. And so being surrounded by uh, so many people who are interested in dismantling white supremacy. And I tell you, Lady Dane, your words are just like you were in this meeting last night and it was like you were there. I mean, everything you were saying, I was like, oh, yeah. And I was taking notes, by the way. That's why I'm always looking down because I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking notes. But I don't feel like in listening to you even that I'm doing enough. And. Um, I, if I, if I am not, if we are not, then we can't continue to pass on the words like you are passing on. And so I, I have work to do in surrounding myself and in surrounding myself with people who will continue to help me. So what you're saying to me is a lesson um, that I need to work toward. All the power to the people. All the yeah. power. <laughs> uh, Diane, let's dig in. Let's get into it. Yeah, feeling, I mean, for me, safety means being able to be my authentic self and to always communicate um, spaces of discomfort um, in any kind of relation, whether it's a, um, a platonic relationship, a friendship, um, professional spaces. Um, I'm always very clear to articulate where there's a problem. And that is something I grew into um, over the years of, of dealing with the trauma of things happening. And I just decided my job is not to take care. And, and because the only place I would feel unsafe is outside of my community around white people. And that's just a reality for me. And so I no longer feel unsafe in those spaces because I have a clear articulation of where the problems are when they are there. Yeah. I'm no longer quiet. I don't have the need to take care of Blanche Myrtle, Susie, Tom, Dick, or Harry. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't have. I don't have that need to do that. And um, you know, it, in thinking about this idea of safety, it's making me think of the last place where I was the director of a particular department and the ways in which everything I did, um, there was someone trying to get in my way and oh. trying to box me in, make me feel uncomfortable, make me feel unworthy of being there, um, challenging my whole sense of being. And I remember going into my boss's office and I said, everybody in this institution gets to be exactly who they are. You hired a black girl with a hyphenated identity who's Afro-Caribbean, who's from the South Bronx, who lives in Harlem, who's the daughter of immigrants. That's what you're going to get. Everything. I'm not going to come in here and not be the black girl that lives in Harlem. That is what I'm going to do if everybody gets to be their authentic selves, all the ways they are seeking to oppress my being and to make me feel unsafe, then I get to be who I am and mm -hmm. to counter that. Mm. So I no longer, you know, it, I, you know I, I, I would sit in meetings and say, I don't have time to play with y'all. 
y'all are doing too much and not enough. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't have time for this. Mm-hmm. You know? So safety for me doesn't exist in, in that, you know, feeling unsafe in, in those ways don't exist for me. Um, where safety becomes an issue for me is when I watch what's happening to men and women who look like me on a daily basis um, is when I begin to feel this sense of urgency for the work that we've got to do to um, to cause a, sh- a real shift in this country. Like, like Lady Dane said, it's not just about November 3rd. If we really want to talk about safety, it's the work that we have to do come the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, <laughs> on and on and on. If we really want to talk about what safety looks like in this country, we have to talk about the continual work. And I think that's why for me, Fannie Lou Hamer was so important because somehow she understood that. It wasn't just about her getting into office. It was all of the work that she was doing in addition to getting, getting into office. That is the work that Lady Dane is talking about. You know, mm-hmm. I want to, you know, just talk. You know, Lady Dane, you, I mean, everything you said was spot on, and particularly about this idea of trauma and what we're facing within our community is that many of us don't know that we're experiencing trauma, and we don't, we don't know, and we don't have the language to articulate what's welling up inside of us. So a lot of the things that we're putting off on each other is the pain and the pain that has been handed down and has been packaged nicely for us. And that pain is rooted in um, all from the systemic racism, from the Jim Crow days, from Jim Crow laws to um, white supremacy. All of that has been packaged so nicely for us, you know? It's like the equivalent, I remember I was taking care of a friend once and the aunt came to the hospital and this girl is like, she's she's dying of cancer and the aunt comes to bring all this stuff and I told her she needs to take a little Tiffany box of pain and, and she ain't gonna unwrap it here. She need to take a little mm. box of pain and take it on back with her. What mm. we've been really good as good at as a community is handing down the pain, is handing down the trauma. And we've been good at it because we don't even recognize that that's what we're doing. So what you're talking about, Lady Dane, is really getting at the heart of that and really having people, and that's another thing about safety, feeling safe enough to even talk about, I'm in pain and I don't know why. I'm hurting and I don't know why. You know, I think that there's been so much, um, so much put on us and and that's not even our own in the ways in which we move through the world and um, we have to be strong and we have to, like, I've never subscribed to that strong black woman thing. I don't know what that is. I don't know who she is, but (laughs) (laughs) I've never subscribed to it. And, you know, that for me is where pain resides also and where feeling unsafe resides that you just always got to be like, that's the stuff that we got to chip away at. Mm. That's this idea of perfectionism. Yeah. That has to be squashed. Yeah. That yeah, was we wonderful. Have to everything and all, everything and all things for everyone, right? And the one misstep, right. then there's something wrong with us. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. We don't, and, and it's unfair, you know. And a lot of the work that I, I I do, I look at a lot of video footage that's surrounding some of the stuff that's happening, you know, culturally and socially. And what has been striking me is when I look at how Black women are affronted in mm-hmm. out in the world in society and how she begins to take on this vibrato almost from a very mat, like she's emulating how a man would respond to such things. 
And it always makes me think of Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman, right? Because mm -hmm. at some point that black woman no longer sees herself as a woman because she has to protect herself. And I've watched this, these videos with this kind of thing. And oftentimes there are men sitting around watching this woman having to defend herself in this way. And it's, it's really, it's, it's a lot. It's a heavy, heavy burden, right? It's a heavy armor. It's a heavy armor. Dana, I see you. I you. think. Yeah, my cam, my y'all, my camera is over here. My mic, my mic was coming on and off. I was like, hold on, mute my mic, unmute my mic. Hold up, child, honey. She's doing stunts and shows tonight. I, Child, if y'all could just see my phone right now, Stunts it's like <laughs> the top row is like gone, and I'm like, I, well, y'all can hear me, so I'm still here, I guess. Um, no, I was, child, no, I was gonna say, you know, it's you know this this idea, right, of like packaging pain, right? Mm -hmm. It's because also that pain, that trauma, also sometimes makes us rich, literally. We Literally. are rewarded. How we are many rewarded. Pl how many plays have we seen where it's just trauma porn? How many oh. movies have we seen where it's just trauma porn? Where it's just violence on black bodies for the sake of violence Absolutely. on black bodies? Absolutely. Which is which is what which is right? Which is like which is um, and then we're told, and then we're told that you're only noble when you suffer. And I reject that. I reject that notion of us needing to suffer. I reject that now notion I of, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, I reject but, that. <laughs> you know, and as artists, that's the other thing because when you think about suffering, right? And and as mm -hmm. artists, this idea of we're supposed to be suffering for the work. I'm like, look, <laughs> clearly I ain't missing any meal. <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't like those those things just don't make sense to me. Like, why are we do who doing that? <laughs> And I want to say this too, just to reflect on what you said, Diane, I actually think, you know, this is the thing. When we peel back the layers, I think what we call masculine and feminine ain't actually that. I hmm. actually think what happened, because we really look back into history, there were warrior goddesses who were as comfortable in the bedroom and as comfortable okay. with makeup on as they were with taking a machete to somebody's neck. And oh, so for me, when I when, when we're talking about <laughs> when I we are talking about you know, I'm talking about masculine and feminine in the in just in contemporary times, just looking at how um you know young black women are having to fend for themselves and take care of themselves in situations they clearly can't win in, and it's an mm -hmm. unsafe space for them to be in. And you know just thinking about that, you know, and why should they have to be in that position, right? Why should, why should someone um, take liberties on their person in that way to begin with, right? And then why do they have to be in the position of having to defend themselves in a space that they clearly cannot win in because they're overpowered, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a serious issue, and I think this comes back to Lady Dane when we're talking about what's happening to trans women. It's the same thing. It's, it's no one should take liberties over our bodies the way that they do, and there's something about, you know, I think patriarchy that allows that to be true and because there's that for black men too and it's real and we have to talk about it if we're talking about really i mean healing and um from a holistic perspective we have to have all of these conversations no matter how difficult they are you know yeah, i wonder what the role of community is right because i think that you know, oftentimes what have what has come up, y'all. I also I still my 
my phone is being shady. Um, so <laughs> so all I all I see right now are my hands <laughs> and hope and Diane. Well, this is no lady name. We see all of you. We see all of you in your okay, whole good. Show. You have your whole yeah. your whole self in sight. <laughs> awesome. So I you know, I, I I so I wonder, right, because like even as even as we talk about um <clears throat> You know, this idea of we take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, really? Because if we really want to get down to, like, the nitty gritty of it, it's like, you know, if you see a girl who is being attacked in the street, if you see a man who is being attacked in the street, are you going to put on some boxing gloves and go on defend that person? Are you going to go on and, 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 and mediate the situation so that there is peace in the community? Um, if you know somebody's hungry, you're going you gonna to get food for them. If you know somebody um, needs to leave an abusive relationship, because also I think sometimes I'll say this in this space, because, you know, we are all um, who we are. There have been times where it's like, you know that there is a person who is being abused in a house. Are we going to really do as a community what we need to do to make sure that when that woman, when that sister leaves that abusive man, that she has a place to lay her head, mm -hmm. that she has food on her table. And so like for me, um, the, the, the questions that I ask in regards to the work that needs to happen after the fourth and the fifth and on the fifth and the sixth and the seventh, it's like, what does it mean for us to create a community of care Oof. that transcends and that is not invested in patriarchy as the saving grace or even capitalism as the saving Ooh. grace? Well, I was, I how mean, we, how I do this. we love on each other in a way that is transformative? Go ahead, Hope, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, 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 I was, um, I was just going to say the one thing that I think that can be overcome. But the the issue of it is that the one thing that I found that's more addictive than sugar is power. And mm. people want power so much that they intend uh, to do good, but then that takes over, the power takes over because then you have to relinquish it to someone else. So you, maybe you have to share it or it tasted good or it felt good, the power that you had. And that's when community breaks down to me. When, when someone is so in charge that they can make decisions and rules and then they're wearing a cloak and they're wearing a crown and they don't want to give it up. Whereas power really is in this conversation. Power is really in your uh, comments, Lady Dane. Your comments, Diane, are all on this paper that I'm writing in. That <laughs> is collectively giving me what I need so that then I can continue and grow. So this com community is the way is really the only way, but mm -hmm. then community needs to be redefined. We need to redefine um, and dismantle our training so that we can start to build up again. And it can't just happen one at a time. It has to happen as a unit. Well, I mean, to, to, to both of your points, you know, when I think about community and, um, and, I think about how I move through the world and how I live. And I'm fortunate, I'm very fortunate that I have a community that um, I don't care what's going on, they will move heaven and earth <laughs> and we will do that for each other. And, you know, I hadn't talked about this in a while, but one example, it was two years ago when my mom passed, I didn't know what I needed, but I had about like my girlfriend's, they came out for nine days and nine nights. They sat with me. No one, they wouldn't leave me alone. They were here. Like, you know, the things you see in the movies where the old church ladies come and they sit around you all day. That's what, that's essentially, that's what they did. They cooked, they cleaned. One day I got out by myself and they were calling each other. Well, who let outside? Like, <laughs> that <laughs> love. Um, but, mm. I think that that's really powerful. And I, in this conversation, I'm realizing just how many communities I'm fortunate to have that is in that way. Um, I live in a building that I've been in for 20 some odd years. There's a community in here. My neighbors, like someone was staying here. I was away. They were like, who lives there? 
And they were like, Miss Diane, okay, then you're fine. So the, that's the kind of community you're talking about, Hope. And we have to be able to give of ourselves also in order to find that kind of community, right? So we cannot talk about wanting um, community, all of us collectively, but we're not able to be transparent enough mm. and vulnerable enough to allow community to find us. Mm -hmm. I and think that love transform. Important. True. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. A laying on her hands, honey. Uh, and that and that's what color I was girls when she said I was that's missing I was something. A laying on her hands, not a laying on her bodies, but a laying on her hands, honey. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was Mother thinking. Mother God is into saga. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, this is like, I mean, we're at we're at time, but this is this is what I am so proud to be a part of. This is what I'm so proud to, to, to be able to call, as Toshi Reagan says, call a circle, you know, because this is, this is where the transformative love, this is where the community saving, being its own salvation starts. So I want to thank Hope, Diane, Lady Dane. Thank you for being here to close us all, close us out for this series. This was like the perfect way to just, bring it on home. And I want to share one last quote from, from Fannie Lou Hamer, which is, you can pray until you faint, but unless you get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. See, right there. Right so there. That, that's the last bit from Miss <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer. But thank you so much for joining us. Check out um, MBT's Facebook page, Instagram, Thanks. website. I'm so filled with love. I don't really... I'm, I'm struggling to find the words, but <laughs> thank you so much for joining us.